Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. Sorry I was away during the intro. Um, anyway, uh, you can find me on Twitter at SimpleScott in case uh, any of you are on your phones and you want to ask questions, feel free to ask it via that platform. I will try and get back to as many of you as I can, even though I'm still horrible at responding over Twitter. Uh, I'll try my best. So even for myself, it's actually kind of weird to step so far back. Uh, September of 2007 seems like a long time ago now. Uh, this was the time in which I joined the Obama campaign. Um, myself and one other person, John Slavic, were hired on the same day, uh, pretty much September 1st, before Obama had won Iowa, but uh, definitely after he had announced his run for, for uh, the office of president. We, um, we had a lot of work uh, that we needed to do. Uh, a lot of the campaign graphics that had been done were using many of the same tricks that we had seen in, in graphic designs, uh, political past. Uh, a lot of drop shadows, beveled edges. Um, brand standards weren't necessarily something that was uh, in the minds of the people within the campaign. Uh, graphic design in the political campaign was actually thought mostly, the only real kind of design constraint was time. How fast can we get something out the door? Uh, they were working at such, at such a quick pace that they needed to design things on the fly. And because of that, many things got dropped. There were many problems that occurred. You can see the, the image on the left-hand side here is Obama announcing in Springfield that he's going to run for, um, for president. And you can notice that the kind of white area of the O is actually dropped out. Um, and so that, that rising sun, that white space that is left to embody a new day in America has now become this very dark star rising. And so there could be bad connotations with some of these graphics if, uh, if graphic designers weren't paying very close attention to details. Uh, a lot of italic type, a, a lot of uh, outlines, and there was really no consistency between, from one event to another event. Like I said, it was myself and one other person. Uh, I was hired in September to handle much of the web communications. Uh, and another individual, John Slavic, was um, supposedly going to handle much of the print communications, right? So they decided to hire two designers, one focused on web, one focused on print. And uh, when John and I began talking, we realized that this is never going to be the way that this is going to work. Uh, it doesn't make sense for me to go off in my direction and for him to go off in his direction. There needed to be a relationship between what you saw online and what you saw in print. So many of the things that we were designing, things like site maintenance, the email graphics, the landing page graphics, all the feature graphics for the web world had to relate to the literature, credentials, banners, rally signs, event ticket and flyers. Uh, those were the things that had to be done every single day, practically. So those, that was the workflow, and that was much of the work that we were having to do on a daily basis. Uh, things like user research, the site architecture, uh, social networks, creating a new site design starting from scratch, uh, brand standards, all these things that you traditionally do in the, in the forefront of your process, we weren't going to be able to do because the campaign was already off the ground. It was said best in my interview when Michael Slaby told me that we're truly building this airplane while it's in mid-flight. And we realized that we were going to have to put this campaign together and redesign much of the campaign graphics as we were moving. And that was a very different process for both John and myself. And we had to make sure that uh, these things were looking somewhat similar and that we could create a consistency and a balance, which is uh, something that I'll, I'll talk about now. The, uh, we never really set out to create uh, or wrote down major missions as to, okay, here's what we're going to do because we were moving too quickly for that. But when we would step outside and we would take a, a little bit of a break, we began realizing that there were certain things that were happening with every single graphic we were creating. One of those was that we needed to deliver very clear and concise messaging. We needed to focus on we much more than we focused on he. This was not a campaign about Barack Obama. As much as we really, as much as it, it was about Barack Obama, it was much more about the people that were involved in this political election. It was, it was way more important that the messages that these people hold, held in their hand or when they interacted with something online, it came from their voice and it came from their own thoughts, not from the campaigns. 
this, the sign doesn't say Obama and they're holding it up. They're saying change we can believe in. And that was something that had to play out in much of our graphics. And at any moment where we could actually control or uh, make sure that, that we're thinking about messaging, we had to make sure we focused on that. But what are our responsibilities? Our responsibilities were to determine this message and how does it set on the page? What, type, what typography do we use? In this case, uh, bold Gotham set on top of some lighter Gotham. Uh, this, was, this is an important statement that we had to make. We knew that it had to be a bold message. It had to be focused on the word change rather than we can believe in because we knew that that message was going to be changing on a daily basis. One of the second core th themes that kept coming up was do we use the word hope or do we use the word change? This, is, this was very early on in the campaign. Uh, we needed to keep the message of hope while dismantling this notion of being aloof. Barack Obama was already being talked about in the media as being maybe a little too high in the sky, right? He was talking a lot about hope, he was talking a lot about change, but what is he really gonna do? Let's get down to the nitty gritty. You can't run a political campaign on the word hope. Uh, others have tried it and it doesn't work very often. People will come after you. I think what this image shows really well is the fact that the word hope, which is actually spelled out there with the Obama O replacing the O in hope, isn't the thing that's communicating, communicating hope. In fact, the imagery is what's communicating hope. The rainbow is what's actually communicating this idea of hope. When, when you're talking about the emotive qualities of design, the one thing design can do is it can communicate directly to your soul. It can capture you in the one place uh, that, you, that is most inspirational. And we could remove some typography and remove some of the messages if we could actually communicate through a stylistic consideration. It's really hard to not make the sky seem aloof when stuff like this is going on. At the end of the rainbow is where all the politics are occurring. This wasn't Photoshop. This really happened. So throughout, the campaign, throughout this campaign trail, we were thinking, how do we... How do we communicate hope without being overzealous or over the top? The third core theme that we kept kind of focusing on was to communicate the historic atmosphere of this campaign by pulling from imagery of the past. On the left is a linotype specimen book, and on the right is the more perfect union speech piece. You can see certain similarities. They're not necessarily a direct ripoff, but there are certain things that have been pulled out in order to communicate uh, to people that this is a historic time. It's one thing just to say, this is a really historic time. It's another thing to embody that and show that in your design work, to make all of the work appear historic. Uh, certain things like drop caps in the initial sentence or this very nice uh, rounded uh, serif that you see at the top or just peeling things directly from the Constitution, right? So by just using some of these images from the past, we can communicate that instantly to people without saying a word. The fourth uh, theme was to establish a consistency and balance to exemplify stability and experience. Barack Obama was a junior senator. Many of us in Illinois knew who he was. Uh, around the rest of the world, this was a new face, this was a new name. And to them, they had no idea who Barack Obama was. In fact, some people still don't know who he is, uh, but that's beyond the point. The thing that we knew we could do with design is we could, make, we could unroll this campaign so that way it seemed more organized than a Clinton campaign or more organized than any other veteran politician that was in the game. And we could do that through very, very consistent typography by making sure that our message was not only consistent, but that our typography was consistent. The sign that was in front of him, the sign that was behind him, Everything matched, typographically, color-wise, down to the colors on his necktie. We wanted everything to seem very, very consistent. To instill this loyalty in people, we had to somewhat repeat ourselves and to show that consistently we were organized and everything looked and gelled together as one. So my main task was this website. Uh, this wasn't a bad website. It wasn't a horrible website. Um, in fact, a lot of people were giving it high marks in, in political uh, websites at the time. I looked at it and kind of cringed. I think it's using about 37 typefaces and every shade of blue I think has been uh, used. Not to mention there are one, two, three scroll bars instead of one. I mean, there were major problems. But the thing that I saw that was its largest problem is that everything is having to get squeezed above the fold. 
right? So it, all these feature graphics are beginning to get really, really small, and you're having to pack a lot of information in something that isn't necessarily vertically uh, ordered. So I was having a lot of problems when I was doing this daily up, updating. And uh, it was my mission within the campaign to get people excited about the idea of relaunching a website for a political candidate. Uh, this didn't happen very often in political campaigns. Traditionally in political campaigns, they would launch a website when the candidate initially started running, and they would use that same tool throughout the rest of the, the race. We are very limited, and this was around October, November. Uh, so a couple months before Iowa, and the words that were going around in, political, in, in the political headquarters was, uh, what can you do for Iowa? What can you do for Iowa? That was kind of the motto that everybody was thinking. What can, what can you do today for the state of Iowa? So that way we can win that state. We have to win that state. And so I sent out an email saying, um, IA meeting. And I sent that around to some of the people within the new media staff. And a bunch of people showed up. Like the room started filling up. And I was like, all right, this worked. So everyone sits down and I start talking about the website and I start talking about what are the missions of the website? What are we trying to accomplish on not the whole website but on the home page? What are we trying to do? And everyone's like, I thought this meeting was about Iowa. This meeting's about information architecture. I'm trying to figure out what we're trying to do on this home page. I fooled everybody into believing that we were going to talk about Iowa. And they came in and, and they were delighted uh, when they left the meeting because we, we nailed down some pretty secure ideas. Uh, we created this, I, I created this diagram shortly after our talk, and these are the main points that we were trying to hit on. The larger the box, the more important that was as a, as a mission item within the home page. The, the first most crucial part of that home page was to persuade people to vote for Barack Obama. That was our number one mission. The second was to raise money. We needed money in order to, defeat, yes, defeat Hillary Clinton, to pay our salaries, to run TV ads, to hire people on the ground, to to have large print budgets so we could print flyers and brochures for all the different people groups. All these things had to be done. We definitely wanted to activate people. We wanted to get them involved in our, in, in our movement. We wanted to get them involved uh, calling people, knocking on doors, and being a part of this uh, political process. We needed to localize information. We needed to say, if you're in Ohio, Here's some other people in Ohio that are doing things. Here's how Barack Obama feels about issues that, that uh, you have in your area. We needed to represent many different people groups. There's a large diversity in America, and we wanted to show that uh, many of the ideas that, that Barack Obama is presenting is, is and is going to represent you. We also needed to educate people, tell them who Barack Obama was. This is a brand new face on the political map. We had to introduce Barack Obama and we needed to connect people and say he's everywhere. He's on YouTube, he's on Facebook, he's on Twitter. Uh, and a lot of people are very interested in why that box is so small. And they would think that it would be the reverse, that you wanted people to connect. And it, this was a very successful social media platform. But I'm talking about just the homepage for BarackObama.com. If we want people to connect with Barack Obama on Facebook, they're not going to do it on our website. They're going to do it on Facebook. Um, if they want to follow him, uh, they're going to do it on Twitter. They're going to see somebody else is following him and hopefully follow him that way. So connecting wasn't necessarily our main mission on the homepage. So by taking those core missions and then doing a swipe of content audit and determining what content needs to be on that page, we can start to formulate these boxes and these modules that show not only what the missions were, but correlate those to the information that needs to go on the homepage. And all of a sudden, the site begins to start looking a little bit like a design. Much of those box diagrams, there were rounds and rounds of those before we got to this, which begins to look somewhat like a website. Probably not like the website you remember seeing. This was uh, merely a design comp. Uh, but now we were able to ask all the questions at this stage in the process, like what colors should we use? Should it be bright blue? Does this make his head seem like he's a little too in the sky? Maybe that's the wrong way to go. Maybe this makes him feel a little too ominous and Darth Vader-esque. Let's, let's bring some gray in. Uh, let's, let's communicate that, that feeling that you have uh, while walking around the streets of DC, where you see all of this uh, marble on both sides of you. And that way, we can not have this reverse type, which is a, a problem for some readers on the web. What happens when you use a full color image, like you saw on the slide before? Uh, when you're talking about this candidate in, in particular, 
it was important for us to say, well, what happens if we did a full color image? We don't have as much uh, control over this image as we do that top image. And we're showing kind of an Obama on top of, of an Obama. And, and, and you can see it a little bit more here than you can here. I think it's a little dark at the top of the screen. But here, his face is a little washed out on, on most screens. And it was darker on the one above it. And we were very, very concerned throughout the entire uh, campaign that we were going to get called out for Photoshopping his face to be one color or another color. And we had to be very cautious of that. And so putting two images, as well as putting constant like full color images on our website without making sure that we run that through a filtering process to know, all right, that's pretty close, um, we had to make sure of that. We didn't want to make him appear more white or more dark. That was, uh, it, it, it's one of those sensitive subjects where you think, why am I, you know, why are we having to do this? Don't people understand that depending on the color temperature of a light that his skin may shift one way or another? Obviously, not everybody in America knows this, especially Fox News. So it's important to, to do these kinds of things. But that's why uh, it was important for us to look at that feature area and say, what else can go in there? Obviously, just putting a face of Barack Obama all the time isn't really carrying through that message focused on we. And so typically what we had in this central space is, is a feature graphic very focused on what people could do right now or tomorrow or when deadlines were. This was an area that was uh, the most, the area that most people saw when they came to the website initially, the most uh, highly read uh, space. If you look at most of the eye charting diagrams, you'll notice that eyes tend to go to the upper left of any, web, of any website. So this was a highly dense area, and we could put a lot of information there. But the website has done, through this design process, it's achieved a couple of things. We now have very tight color consistency. We have a consistency typographically. Uh, you'll notice that there's a little bit of Gotham being used, upper lowercase, different weights. Uh, you'll also notice that there's a very firm kind of hierarchy. But the thing this page does most is that we, we destroy that entire idea that websites don't scroll. We all know that websites scroll. And you can pack a lot more information and achieve all of your goals if you just let the page scroll and you open up the page below. Every, everything everybody was doing in the campaign was important. And so if the National Voter Protection Center wanted an area on the website, we wanted to highlight them. We wanted to show what they were doing. And we wanted a place to be able to do that. So that second, that, well, third column in this design, which we called column two in, the, in CSS. So my brain still says call two. Um, but the Action Center or the Voter Protection Center, all these things we could place into that sidebar. It could kind of be our dumping ground for all the things that we needed on the site. As well as you can see that localizing map. So no matter uh, what state you're in, you could go click and get involved uh, with the organization in your state. But no site is uh, just stand still on the web anymore. Uh, we didn't stop there. We constantly were iterating and iterating. The saturation of blue became denser and, and brighter. We added another candidate, so we had to put him up at the top of the page. Uh, Things like the feature graphic could now span a full width. In case uh, there was an important event, we could span both columns. Uh, we streamed every single event live. We made sure that if it was Obama or Biden doing a stump speech, you could watch that whole presentation in full. Uh, the media has done an excellent job of giving us the cliff note version. Or, ooh, that guy just slipped and fell. Hope you're all right. Um, but we've seen, we've seen the media do a great job of clipping and showing these little cuts. We could show the entire presentation to people. And I think a lot of people um, have viewed this as a new medium for the way political campaigning is going to work in the future. The web is ob obviously the portal to find information, whether it's how many delegates they have or, um, or what, what their next event is and where they're going to be. The thing that I found int most interesting about the page going up and us eliminating that scroll is it also aligned us with other organizations that do that. Think of the websites that you go to that have scrolling pages, maybe on a daily basis. Probably the Chicago Tribune, probably the New York Times, probably CNN. I'm naming all the media sites. We didn't look like a political group. We looked like a media organization that was presenting the media of what was going on in this campaign. Not only focused around Barack Obama, but all of the events that surrounded the campaign. It's a pretty good place to align yourself with. My.BarackObama.com was really the 
area that really differentiated our website. It was much more than a news organization. And you found that usually after a couple of clicks. You began to realize that there's a way that I can connect with an entire community of other supporters. So even if you're in an area, a rural area in Iowa that's mostly Republican, you can go online and find other people nearby that are supporting that same candidate. And that was incredibly helpful for us. Uh, or you could pick up the phone and call people from your house and get, the voter, get a voter list and just start calling people and asking them who are, their, who are they supporting in this election and why are they supporting that candidate and whether they'd consider voting for Barack Obama and answer any questions. Uh, we used this as a, as a portal for people to connect. Uh, again, this was much more about the people than it was about us dictating what people said about our candidate. It wasn't just me that was uh, doing the stuff. I, I was led by a bunch of pink unicorns. This is a click through and that's his little buddy conversion rate back there with the shield. They went to battle for us even on election day. Without these guys, nothing, nothing would have got accomplished. Uh, so the new media team was actually a fairly, it was the brainchild of Joe Rosbars, who came from the Howard Dean campaign. Uh, ran a company called Blue State Digital for four years, doing a lot of senator, sen uh, senatorial races and congressional races. He uh, built this company called Blue State Digital, which focused on the software that ran political campaigns, from donation pages to the my.brockobama.com engine. All of that was built by Blue State. They basically, during the Dean campaign, they realized, man, we're building all this stuff on the fly. Wouldn't it be great if there was just a tool that was out there so all, polit all Democratic candidates could use this tool and it would be a lot easier to organize? Uh, and that's what they did for four years. So he had this tool, but he realized that he was in for a totally different beast when it came to a presidential campaign. So he hired Chris Hughes from Facebook to lead the my.ruckabama.com team. Chris obviously knew a little bit about connecting people online, and we, we uh, used him to kind of keep uh, making sure that we were connecting people in the right places and making sure that those uh, connections were maintained and that we were reaching out to the people that we wanted and doing the right outreach. Our social networks team led our text message program as well as if, uh, all of the social media networks that we have online, Twitter, Facebook, and the like. Uh, the video team did a really good job of telling this whole story of the campaign, not just following Barack Obama around to the camera. The news media was already doing enough of that. But they were also telling the story of what was happening on the ground. They were following everyday Americans and asking them what they thought about this political campaign. I think this is what differentiated us from a lot of the other campaigns. Uh, we were managing to connect directly with what was happening on the ground way better than, than many of the other groups. Our online ads team did a wonderful job of building up our reach online. And if you were on any other website, a news site or, or the like, and you were reading a story about Obama, there was probably a, a skyscraper you know, banner ad on the right-hand side of the page that would say, last time to donate, click here, or last day to register to vote, click here. Uh, and that was a highly lucrative and successful uh, organization within our department. It started off as one guy, and as it grew, we realized that for every $1 we spend in an online ad, it was converting to about $10 in donations. Yeah. I have a question. So I wonder how much of your success with the media do you think is reflected on the fact that Obama was attracting a young demographic of interested voters if McCain had taken the same techniques? Mm -hmm. Do you think he would have been as successful, or is it reflected on who was attracted to Obama that reaching out to Facebook made sense? Right. Well, I, th I think um, reaching out to Facebook now always makes sense. That, that demographic is kind of, has, has been blown wide open in the last two years, um, if not the last uh, five years. But I think that the one, the one thing that was crucial and one thing that I'll talk about, when it comes to young voters, it was great to get them interested and get them involved and to put that information out there of what is happening and what is going on. Uh, kind of introduce them to politics overall in general. And uh, McCain was not as flexible there. He was not uh, agile enough. He couldn't really present that information, I think, as effectively, which made us, I think, um, which is one of the reasons for our success. But that's only step one. Step two I'll get to in a little bit, and that is that it's great to inspire young people, but the truth of the matter is every other political election, they didn't go out and vote. And, and so getting all these young people revved up and talking about the issues is one thing, but if they don't go to the polls, we lose. 
so how do we get them actually to say one thing and, and, and then enforce it and make it happen? To continue with the diagram, I think that the, the email team did a great job of filling up our inboxes. States and people groups, they were in charge of just telling us what was happening on the ground. They were our liaisons. We needed that. The blog told the, st the story the same way that the video team did. But the real uh, linebackers of our organization was our analytics crew. And I'm a firm believer in this now. And at first, I was very skeptical. If, how many designers are there in the room? I should ask this question initially. Graphic designers. You, you would call yourselves graphic designers. How many web designers, uh, interaction designers? A couple of you. Uh, I saw a couple of the same hands, which is good. Um, if you haven't started looking into putting the smallest amount of analytics on your website, or you're not looking at where traffic goes on your website, change that habit right now. Uh, graphic design, as it traditionally has been taught, as it, as it sits, is not the way it works on the web. If you want to be a web designer, learn analytics. Uh, your ideas of whether that blue button just looks better on the page, it doesn't matter. Does the red button work better than the blue button? Does the green button work better than the red button? This has been a question that um, philosophy and design has asked for a long time, but now there's a way to measure it. And we can tell exactly how many people have clicked that button when it's this color in comparison to when it's this color. We can no longer speculate about what, uh, whether a one column layout or a two column layout is better for the donation page. Uh, we can test all these things. And we can determine the value, the number of value that we had here in comparison to the number of value that we had here. So all of my design decisions could come down to me asking analytics, which one works better? This was way too important for me to just say, I think my idea is the best because I'm a designer and I studied that and you didn't, so my idea is, is what we're going to go with. This was way too important. I wasn't going to do that. I needed, I needed value, valuable information, empirical data that would allow me to make my decisions. And that's what really happened. That was, a, that was really highly successful for our organization. But the reason that I think we were able to win this election, and, and the reason why so many people tuned in, was not only due to the fact that we had a really beautiful brand, not only due to the fact that we had a really informative website. Um, it was not about just those things. It wasn't about just crunching the numbers. It was partly due to the fact that we were, that we were able to tell the story of what was going on in this campaign. And we were able to connect with people of all different every single different generation, from all different backgrounds. We were able to connect to them and show them that this was a candidate for them. Because we, we focused it on them. We weren't focused on our own political campaign. We were focused on the root of politics, the grassroots. And it was that focus that was the reason for our victory and the reason that I think we were, we, it was such a successful campaign. But back to that notion, right? So yeah, you, you inspired a bunch of people and you gave them information and everybody said that they were more informed about this political election than any other politi political election in the past. Good work. That's only step one. Step two is getting these guys off of their computers and stop clicking around and being attracted by these bright lights and go do something. But there was a huge problem. The biggest problem is that, that in our country, this is, this is the general instructions for how you register to vote. Just to register to vote. Most countries, you don't even have to register to vote. You just walk in and vote, which is probably how it should be in this country. So let's just read a couple of this. Like, let's read just, let's get started here. Who can use this application? If you are a US citizen who lives or has an address within the United States, you can use, this, uh, you can use the application in this booklet to register to vote in your state, report a change of name to your voter registration office, report a change of address to your voter registration office, or register with a political party. Exceptions, right? On and on and on and on. How do you use this application? Uh, first time voters who register by mail, on and on and on. Application instructions. That was just the general instructions. Now I need a form for the application. Here's how I fill out the form. Box one, name. Put in this box your full name in this order. Last, first, middle. Really? You had to tell me that? You had to create a whole, like, whole separate instruction guide for the thing, the form that you're going to walk me through? You already are. You're already giving me that last, middle, last, first, middle. Got it. 
don't think I'm going to mess that up. I don't need that extra sheet of instructions. But these are the forms. These are the forms that we see all the time in, in many of our government processes that are just ludicrous. So it was brought to my attention that registering to vote was a big problem. And David Pluff put out a goal. He said, we want to register one million new voters. If we can register one million new voters in this election, we are going to win. He just said that, point blank. He was a really, David Pluff was a great campaign manager. He's like the guy that you want ultimately to be your manager because he would usually just sit in the back of the room and not say a single word until you came, it had something like wrong or a bad idea and then he would tell you, that's a horrible idea, you don't want to do that. But you could think about this, this, and this, and this. Um, and then he would just say like flat out, here's what we need to do, right? Like give you that direct, firm guidance. We need to register one million new voters. Go. He didn't care how it was done. He didn't care what typeface I used. He didn't tell me the font's too big or too small or make the logo bigger. None of that mattered to him. What mattered to him is that we registered one million new voters and he put it in our hands. So Chris Hughes and I got together and we said, how do we make this happen? How do we register one million new voters? Vote for Change became the ultimate site, but before that I figured my name was Simple Scott and I'll call it Simple Vote, and it'll be the greatest self-promotion stunt I could ever do. But basically, there are too many questions when it comes to registering to vote. Let's just simplify the process. Get started. So this is how you're going to register to vote. This was an idea that I put together 20 minutes before the meeting. I designed this uh, and built this in a keynote presentation. So when it comes down to getting down and dirty, don't be afraid to perfect your design Think of that idea and then make it in Keynote. Don't even worry about it. Just kind of throw the idea out there. This green line at the bottom was going to represent a landscape or something. I didn't know. I just wanted to throw the idea out there. So what is your email address? What is your name? Notice that I'm asking the question in plain English. I'm not saying email address colon or name colon. I'm not trying to communicate to robots. I'm trying to communicate to American human beings. And therefore, if I ask it in the full question, it might be a little easier to, to understand. Second thing that you should notice is that I'm asking one question at a time. When is your birthday? January 1st, 2008. Many 101 people, people in Usability 101 would say this is the most ridiculous and stupid idea you could ever do. Everyone knows that you don't put only one form field on a page and then make them click a button. It's the worst behavior because you could group these things, right? You could ask at least three or four questions on a page. This is dumb. Why are you doing that? Well, the truth is that if I do it this way, I can do the thing that we do when we actually converse. So if I ask you a question like, what's your name? Hi, I'm Scott. You would answer your name. And then we might, I might ask you something, like typically we wouldn't ask this, but maybe I'd ask you, how old are you? And you say, I'm 54. Oh, cool. I'm 30. If that person's 54, the next question I ask them is not going to be, what college do you, do you go to? Because that wouldn't make logical sense. Computers do this to us all the time. Forms do this to, uh, do this to us all the time, right? Like, if you go to school, what school do you go to? I, didn't, I don't go to school. So we could perform logic. By asking one question at a time, I could say, when is your birthday? You tell me. I do a, I do a logical understanding. I make the computer calculate that and say, if you're between this age and this age, I'm going to ask you, are you a college student? Right? You say yes. Then I'll ask you, what school do you go to? Have you ever registered to vote? What is your permanent address? Now, wait a minute. Why am I asking all these questions? This seems like a lot of questions. Yeah, but if I do this, now I can perform the next bit of logic, which is called strategy. And you can ask one question at a time and start divulging enough information that now you can perform something called strategy. What is your permanent address? You tell me that your permanent address is in the state of Ohio. What is your address at school? And you live in California currently and are going to school at USC? If my computer program knows this, it can perform a little bit of strategy and say, guess what? You're going to vote absentee in the state of Ohio because the state of California, I already know I'm going to win. So the computer can actually do something, perform a little bit of logic, and then a little bit of strategy in order for us to have a better outcome. Where do you live? We're going to search for them. But then at the end, at, at the end of any of these processes, it doesn't make sense just to put them off into a blank la-la land. You have to have a carrot at the end of the race. 
you have to have something for them to work towards. And here what we're presenting is where you can register to vote, where you can uh, sign your absentee ballot or, or your early vote. We can give you very specific instructions. We can tell you exactly where you're going to vote. So I think it was a good idea. It managed to get a lot of people to register to vote. We were just under a million, but uh, we know it was a large success. The, in the state of North Carolina, the number of people that we registered to vote on this website uh, made the difference between the state. We won the state of North Carolina because of the number of people that we had registered to vote on Vote for Change, which is a gigantic success um, for, this, for this website. But with any simple idea, it requires an extremely large amount of complex thought. A lot of nights of eating burritos and bringing out the post-it notes and you're sketching all this stuff out and you're doing all, the, all of the logical questioning yourself and kind of building the survey and determining what we want to do. We have to perform all of the possible outcomes before we build the website in order to perform that kind of logic and that kind of strategy. Just like a game of chess, right? If you're thinking about all those moves that you need to do early on, you can work backwards. So your diagrams that you build start looking a little bit more like you're launching a rocket ship than a website. That was only for, uh, that, this diagram was actually for only one state. Uh, every state has different voting rules. And so this diagram had to be changed 50 times. And then some states, it's county by county. So you would have to do a different diagram for each county, which got a little complex. So we just scrapped the whole idea of ever diagramming all this information. Instead, we just uh, went with it and waited for the lawyers to tell us we had to change something. But we were able to accomplish, uh, I think, a large feat, not only with this website, but with BarackObama.com, with my.barackobama.com. Um, I think that we did a good job within the campaign of building platforms to allow all of you and, and the, all of us that potential, that chance that we actually have a voice and that our voice actually matters in this process. And I think that this campaign, this was the first time that people held their computers high above their head and said, this is, this is my voice. This is what I think. And whether it was on Twitter or Facebook or what you shared or what you liked, all of those things came full circle and motivated an entire group of people to get out and vote and actually do it. Uh, it was a, a pretty remarkable thing to be a part of. Um, me, with my uh, lack of sleep after the campaign, decided that I probably should uh, sleep a little bit. And some of the people in my team went to Washington, D.C. to join the transition team. Uh, Whitehouse.gov, I was approached by the White House to work on this site. And I, I wasn't sure exactly how I was going to be involved. I decided that I would just kind of be an outside contractor uh, and do uh, the core CSS structure and, and the grid system and, deter and, and determine what uh, we could do within the executive branch. At this time, uh, when Obama was inaugurated, at that time, you couldn't have a YouTube page for the candidate. You couldn't have uh, a Twitter account. Many of these things, uh, the, the actual, there actually were amendments to laws that had been in place. The Presidential Records Act had to be amended in order for this kind of stuff to occur. Uh, step by step, they began breaking down walls. And now, whitehouse.gov does an amazing job. I don't know if you guys go to this website. I go to it, I go to it quite a bit, actually. But it's a great location to actually figure out what's going on in the executive branch. Um, I think the Bush administration posted a total of eight blog posts in their eight years. I think it was something like that. Uh, I'm sure within the first uh, 400 days, we had about 800 blog posts. I mean, these guys are, are blogging at a very rapid rate uh, and, and, and really trying to expose and be transparent about what they're doing within, within the branch. So it was. It was kind of one of those big questions that I, that I had after working on all of this stuff. What, what do I do after that? And uh, it, was, it was a realization that I had during the campaign when I saw all, the, all of the artists and designers outside of the campaign that were doing amazing work. Uh, people that I'd always looked up to, I could find inspiration by going to just a few blogs and seeing the work that was happening not only in Chicago but around the world. And uh, I thought that 
it would be important to archive not only the work that we did inside the campaign, which I think was historic, but also the work that people and supporters did um, outside the campaign. And this was a, a way too interesting of a moment in time to just be put on a blog or on a website that in two years might not be there. Uh, I think, though I'm a huge, uh, a huge advocate for websites and for the digital world, there's something about the printed world that doesn't exist in the digital world. And that is that it will remain through time. When you print something, it sits on a shelf for hundreds of years. As long as people will care for the pages that you've, that you've printed, they will remain there in history for as long as possible. And I knew that that was incredibly important. I knew that the ideas that this campaign had uh, and the ideas that the artists and, and the designers um, put out in, in this past election was way too important to just not archive. Uh, so creating a book became of interest to me. And I started talking to publishers, and it, it wasn't working out. Finally, I, I was uh, uh, just kind of through karma. I was introduced to these guys, Charles Adler, who was working in Chicago at the time, uh, who was working on a project called Kickstarter. And Kickstarter is a platform to have any of your creative ideas essentially funded. The same way that the Obama campaign was funded, it would be through kind of these micro, this microfinancing, uh, small donations to add up to whatever, the, whatever capital you need to get started. And I thought this was a perfect platform to raise the money to do the book without using a publisher. Uh, I wanted, it, it, with that, we raised, uh, we had 1,300 backers. We raised $84,614 in, a, I think, a six-week period of time. So we managed to raise a lot of money. Uh, very, very quickly. At the time, this was the most successful Kickstarter project. Uh, I've been trumped twice now, one by another Chicago guy named Scott Wilson, who just recently raised uh, nearly a million dollars with an iP uh, iPod watch. You guys should check it out. It's, it's kind of cool. It's a cool product. He's a good friend of mine. Um, nevertheless, I wanted to walk you through the process. When you, when you say I'm going to buck the system and I'm not going to use a publisher to, to create this book, uh, it requires a lot of tasks. So I won the election, I took a break, I thought about creating this archive, I compiled all the work, collected a list of artists that created Obama artwork, I gathered forwards from Michael Beirut and Stephen Heller, I began discussing the idea with publishers and I started designing the cover because they wanted to see what the cover would look like. I did renderings, I did rough layouts of all the artwork, I emailed all the artists, the artists started uploading their work, publishers began making offers, I quickly realized that publishers really suck. I tried to redline contracts over and over again. I looked into finding investors. I needed a break. I went to Japan. I designed the table of contents when I was in Kyoto. Uh, designed the first draft of the essay. I returned to the States. That's when I ran into Kickstarter. I discussed the project with them, began editing the video, uh, designed promotional materials, e-blasts, built designingobama.com, determined how much it would cost to make the book, launched the Kickstarter project in New York. I emailed friends and family, put it on social networks, gave talks around the country, raised $84,000. Woohoo! Celebrated, continued designing the layout. Began to spec the paper costs, talked to five or six printers about the cost of the book. I waited for the quotes, determined who was capable, picked the three printers, East Coast, West Coast, Chicago, determined the additional cost for the coast. I chose Capital Offset in New Hampshire. Does this book need words? Needed to do a little bit of writing, received the money from Amazon finally and started cutting checks. Finalized the paper purchase, ordered all the materials, finalized the design, waited for the book cloth to get off of a boat from Japan, did editing, finished the design for $4,000, for the $4,000 die. I really don't want to fuck this up. Proof, 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 proof. Prepared all the files, color proofing, press proof, foil proof, send the files, FTP, that didn't work. Uh, Dropbox, that didn't work. CD, how about I telegraph you the files? It's the only way you're going to get them. Finally, the files were received. They began reviewing the proofs. I went to New Hampshire to print. Last minute changes, embossing problems. To alter, we had to alter the design of the cover. Uh, plate making, color tweaking on the press for five days, 21 signatures, foil strikes on the book cloth. The white didn't work. The, st the silver stuck better to the cloth. Who knew? The press operator, of course, manufactured the bookcases. Printing gets folded. The books get stitched. The stitch books get glued to the cover. The case books goes to the die manufacturer. The die gets made. The sleeves go into manufacturing. Send the proofs to me. Realize the white sleeves make the book impossible to get out. Let's order more silver sleeves. Sleeves finally get put on the books. You mean we have to ship these things to people? <laughs> I became close friends with the USPS, made enemies with the USPS, made a bulk mail, bulk mail permit imprint stamp. 
looked into Amazon, Shipwire, FedEx, DHL, freight to the UK, ship via Royal Mail, uh, put these books in suitcases and drop them from airplanes because I don't really care how they get to people. We designed the box, designed the tape, determined how we were going to get labels put on the boxes. We then folded the boxes, inspect the books, wrapped it in bubble, taped the box, ate pizza, sweat our asses off, repeat, the, all, re, repeat those steps, print 1,200 labels, uh, write 450 custom forms, determine who gets what kind of book, place the books on pallets, shrink wrap the books, loading docks, oops, the truck's too short, load the books by hand, restack them, drive them to the post office, bulk mail unit, deal with the lift gates that don't work, paper, the paperwork wasn't right, the wood uh, pallets don't cut it. I almost get into a fist fight with the USPS postal worker. I was a little postal at the post office. I headed to O'Hare for international books, repeat the last nine steps, repeat the last 22 steps, celebrate, try to get the books on Amazon, design an iPad app, fate fiasco, I scream, try to uh, finally spread this book to people who hopefully will cherish it for the rest of their lives. It was actually a really priceless experience. And a lot of people ask me after all of that, would you do it again? Did you realize that it was going to be all like that intense of a, of a process? These publishing companies have been around for a while, so they, they figured out how to make books pretty efficiently, as well as like all of those problems that I ran into that they were like, silly amateur, should have known better than to put your books on wood pallets because the post office won't take them. Uh, but when you f open up that first box, and you see your idea, when you see the, that idea that related almost to the first design that you had or the first dream that you had, and you didn't give in to what the publisher wanted, the publisher wanted to change the title of my book. They wanted to tell me what the cover looked like. They probably wanted a 20% off sticker really big over the logo, which would have made no sense at all. Of course, they wouldn't let me use the logo because I actually don't, I didn't have the rights to use the logo that's owned by the people uh, of this movement, but they didn't care to hear that either. This is how the publishing industry works. And if you're going to boot the system, make sure it looks exactly like how you wanted it to work. The second that I opened it up, and the, the cloth just sparkled. That cloth was way too expensive. I never should have paid for it financially. It made no sense at all. But it looks exactly how I wanted it to look. It looked exactly like the Obama blue. It just shines. The silver, when light hits it, just jumps right off of the page. It was a magical moment for me. It's when I realized that uh, when you stick to, to your dreams, they can actually happen. Like that reality can actually occur. To not only mark that moment in history, but to show everything that was done around it. And to show whether it was small work or really large work. And to put them side by side. Everything was important. Every part of this, every single step was about us. It was about not just them, but it was about us. And then there was that flood of work that, it, that I had to throw on the floor and see that uh, the, the uh, just sheer amount of talent that went into this campaign that we had no control over. But it was all beautiful. It was all equally as important. And making sure that the levels were perfectly right on, on each point, making sure that it got stitched together correctly. All of that really made me realize why we invented the iPad. <laughs> because it, it, it was a laborious process. And I think that it was interesting as I was producing this book that uh, the iPad came out. And I realized that this, is a, this would be a pretty interesting platform to develop uh, this book, a design book, on the iPad. Uh, and so we also created an iPad app to work and coincide with, with the, launch, the public launch of the book, which is exciting for us. Um, but the thing, I think the iPad's really changing the way publishing works. It's changing our idea of how we read and how we'll interact with books in the future. But of course, there's no substitute. A, a written book will still last longer. Uh, the likelihood of it is, is the books that we create now, we're going to have to keep figuring out ways to read all those old books that were never upgraded to the latest firmware or software. With this book, I realized that it's not owned by me. It's not my book. It's actually all of our book. It's every single person that put artwork into this campaign, that made a phone call, that knocked on doors. Uh, and I believe that anything that you really love, figure out a way to make it for free and distribute it. We've had libraries in this country for a long time that have distribute, distributed books and allowed you to go and check it out. Now we have the web. I put this book online. You can actually view the entire book 
front to back, read every single word online. I'm also a part of this group in Chicago called the Post Family. Uh, the Post Family is a group of artists. These guys inspired me to, to do this book. They basically said, do it alone, go alone. Make sure that it's, it's what you want. Don't just go with the first publisher that, that comes along. And, I, and I, I thank them very much for uh, inspiring me to actually do this myself and, and supporting me in that. Uh, we recently did a great project. Uh, I just kind of want to share with many of the designers in the room the uh, project that we did with Levi's uh, recently in San Francisco. Uh, the Post family has been all about getting back to our hands, uh, getting dirty, and, and trying to, to build things and do things ourselves. So all, we are, we're all printmakers. We do silk screening and letterpress. And uh, Levi's invited us out to this workshop in San Francisco that they opened up on Valencia Street to uh, just have a community print shop and to make things and to do things for the community and put those positive words uh, into, into that neighborhood in San Francisco. Two of the prints that uh, I had worked on this week was share and make. I think the, the idea of community came up a lot. And I think that's kind of the, um, the essence of the whole thing, don't you think? Like the idea of right, an open yeah. source yeah. world. Yeah. yeah. Post Family was, I think, this odd combination of everybody having the same idea in their head, which was, I can't afford a studio space by myself, um, let's team up. Uh, you know, we all just kind of came together in our own little ways. I was working with Scott Thomas at the time. He mentioned to me, hey, I got this whole group of friends that want to have space. And we'll all split the rent and it's something that we can afford. We all want a level press, we want a screen print. All of us rock computers for a long, long time. Um, 12, 14 hour days, you know, this kind of five to question mark job that most designers get themselves into. We were all rocking pretty hard on, and we're just looking for a space to get back to our hands and start creating. We all sort of had this like uh, dream of a collective, like a group, like a boys club, like a tree house, you know, like our own little private laboratory. By calling it a family and not making it a business changes the entire dynamic of the group. We're basically around to have a spot for our community to take that step from talking about doing to doing. Put forth. Yeah, Create. do something. Do something. Even though I'm a nerd, I force myself to become somewhat obsessed with this message and getting the word out. What I uh, need you to do is to get me that message in a very brief way with some visual that might get some people's attention. The deal is that what one would want to do would be to give hope and inspire. If you could make this kind of patriotism, cool, then you save the world. I'll never, ever, ever forget when you took, when we got out to dinner, the whole post family and you announced that you were going to work on the campaign. And this is when really no one believed that you know Obama had a shot. And and we all knew, sat there being like, holy crap, because we know how talented you are, you know, and we know where you come from. And I remember looking at being like, holy crap, like your world, the whole world is going to change, you know. The Obama campaign is such a, it was such an interesting experience. Uh, as I was saying, the work environment was uh, a little thrown together. Uh, our team was made up mostly of very furry pink unicorns. It was the imagery, it was the way people perceive things visually. You know, you help change the world with design, and that's what we're all into, and that's, that's a pretty neat thing. Any chance that we had that opportunity within the campaign, it was important that we focused on us, the American people, rather than Barack Obama the man. It was always important that somebody could hold that message in their hand proudly and say that it's their voice. print I did myself was um, if you create something, set it free. There was a moment uh, yesterday when we had the letterpress going and a woman walked in off the street and we actually didn't have a letter E. We only had one letter E in the, in the size that we were doing. And so I told Davy, I'm like, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll just run a second color and we'll include the E in there. And this woman walked in off the street and she's like, oh, that's great. 
you're setting the you're setting it free and, and you let the letter E be free and not be a part of the piece. And she's like, well, it'd be really nice to see that E just like fly off the page. <laughs> and we just I just sat there like that is the most perfect, beautiful design criticism we've ever <laughs> That's the basis for our group, is, uh, is, is sharing. We share a space, we share as many of our resources as possible. We put all of our funds together to buy facilities, to buy presses, to buy ink, to buy you know, a setup for us to do whatever we want. It's a declaration. It's a declaration to say uh, what I believe the, the new frontier looks like. And the new frontier is this open place this place for your dreams to be realized and for your network to be the, those people that inspire you, that make you happy, that um, you can talk about the, the similar things that you're interested in. These are all the ideals of the web. What is it? People that I've known are older than me think that it's crazy, but I still have this like mentality like I'm gonna change the world. We're enough, you know, we have enough energy and enough enough to, to, to make a difference. Thanks. I'll open up for questions. <laughs>